Mrs. B here to talk to you about x-ray production. This is from chapter six of the Essentials of Radiographic Physics and Imaging book, third edition by Johnston and Faber. The radiographer's actions at the control panel directly determine the nature and the makeup of the x-ray beam. The nature and the makeup of the beam in conjunction with the patient, the image receptor, or the IR, and the processing characteristics are going to determine the image quality. The x-ray machine is a tool in this process. An understanding of this tool is one factor that determines the skill of the radiographer. And to this point, the focus has always been on the use of electricity and electrical devices to manipulate the flow of electricity for the purpose of x-ray production. The picture shown on this slide illustrates the inside of the x-ray tube, and this is a general purpose x-ray tube. This may look familiar to you if you watched my video about the x-ray tube. Exposure factors have now been selected. Electricity has traveled to the anode, the cathode, and the filament and electrons have been boiled off of the filament and are streaming across to the anode at tremendous speeds. The filament electrons penetrate the face of the target to a depth of approximately 0.5 millimeters. They interact with the tungsten target atoms in their path. These filament electrons interact with target atoms to produce x-rays in two ways. One way is characteristic interactions, and then the other way is the Bremsstrahlung or Brems interactions. It should be noted that the most of the interactions, approximately 99%, do not result in x-rays. They result in heat. We get about 1% of x-ray photons out of the total volume of electrons going from cathode to anode. So keep in mind, there are thousands of interactions taking place inside the target at one time. But for the sake of explanation, we focus on a single event in each case. You can refer to my video about the structure of the atom, which is a chapter two from this same Faber and Johnston book. So refer back to my video about the structure of the atom and that will explain a little bit more in detail and help you understand the interaction between electrons with the target atoms. As filament electrons enter the anode target, most interact with the outer shell electrons of the tungsten atoms. They do not transfer enough of their kinetic energy to ionize the atom, but rather just enough to raise them to a higher energy level of excitation. This excess energy is immediately given off as infrared radiation or heat as the outer shell electron returns to normal. There are thousands of interactions occurring in the anode target during a single exposure. 99% are causing recurrent excitation and subsequent emission of infrared energy, which is also heat. The end result is that most of the energy from the filament electrons is lost as heat. So we call that heat loss. And only 1% will result in x-ray production, either by characteristic or BREMS interactions. Characteristic interactions involve the filament electron and an orbital electron of a target atom. A filament electron enters a target atom, strikes an orbital electron, and if its energy is greater than the binding energy of the orbital electron, it is removed or pushed out of that orbit. So if you watched my video about the structure of the atom, you will recall that orbital shells fill from the shell nearest the nucleus outward. And a vacancy in a shell makes the atom unstable. 
To correct this situation, outer shell electrons drop in to fill the inner shell vacancies. To do so, the outer shell electron must expend some of its potential energy. This energy is given off as a characteristic X-ray photon. Shown in this picture here, this is showing characteristic interaction, a characteristic interaction event that as outer shell electrons fill inner shell vacancies, their excess energy is released as characteristic X-ray photons. So you need to understand that when a first orbital electron drops to fill the vacancy of another, it's going to leave another vacant spot. This second vacancy is also filled by an outer shell electron that again must give up some of its energy, producing another characteristic photon. This process of outer shell electrons filling inner shell vacancies continues down the line and this creates a cascading effect called a characteristic cascade. Each time an orbital electron moves to a lower orbit, a characteristic photon is produced. This process is not necessarily orderly. If a filament electron removes a K-shell electron from an atom, the most likely electron to fill the vacancy is an L-shell because of its proximity right next to the K. But any outer shell electron can fill the K-shell vacancy. It is just not as likely to do so. Notice that the removal of the orbital electron established the environment for X-ray production, and it is the expending of energy during the cascade that produces the characteristic X-rays. Characteristic photons are so called because their energy is characteristic or dependent on the difference in binding energy between the shells involved. The electron shells of each element have specific binding energies. A tungsten atom has 74 electrons orbiting its nucleus in six different shells. The filament electron may interact with any of them, but medical imaging generally focuses on the K-shell which is the innermost shell. And these interactions have the highest energy and are the most useful for imaging purposes. Recall back from my chapter two video, the structure of the atom. Each orbital electron is held in orbit by a binding energy and the closer the orbit, the stronger the bond. K-shell electrons in tungsten have the strongest binding energy at 69.5 kiloelectron volt. For a filament electron to remove this orbital electron, it must possess energy equal to or greater than the 69.5 kiloelectron volts. For all practical purposes using a general purpose X-ray machine, if a radiographer selects a KVP less than 70 on the control panel, no photons will be produced from K-shell interactions. Shown in this table here, we have binding energies for tungsten, and you can see the different kilo electron volts for each shell of tungsten. The characteristic photon is named for the shell being filled in each case. If an outer shell electron is filling a K-shell, Regardless of where that filling electron is coming from, the photon produced is called K characteristic. If an electron is filling an L shell, the resulting photon is called L characteristic, and then so on. To find the energy of a characteristic photon, the radiographer needs to know the target element, in this case tungsten, and the shells that are involved. Using this information, the radiographer subtracts the binding energy of the farther shell, which is the shell providing the electron, from that of the closer shell, which is the shell with a vacancy. Again, with characteristic interactions, to remove an orbital electron, 
the filament electron must have kinetic energy equal to or greater than the binding energy of the electron with which it interacts. For example, a filament electron has 50 kilo electron volts of kinetic energy and it strikes a tungsten K-shell electron with a binding energy of 69.5 kilo electron volts. It does not have the energy to remove it. So the result of this type of interaction is going to be heat production, and this happens most of the time. Because of this, the K-shell electron is going to absorb the kinetic energy from the filament electron, and it's going to re-emit it as heat energy. This also happens with any other orbital electron, regardless of shell. If the filament electron does not have enough energy to remove it. In such cases, the filament electron, having lost all of its kinetic energy, then just drifts away to fill a vacancy in another atom or become part of the current through the tube. If, however, the same filament electron had 100 kilo electron volts of energy, it would easily remove the K-shell orbital electron and be deflected in a new direction. It would still have 30 kilo electron volts of energy left and with it interact with another atom. The second type of interaction in the target that produces X-rays is a Brims interaction. Brimstrahlung is a German word roughly meaning breaking or slowing down radiation which is exactly what this interaction involves where the filament electron is concerned. In this interaction, the filament electron misses all of the orbital electrons and interacts with the nucleus of the target atom. Remember that the electron is negatively charged and the nucleus containing all the protons is positively charged and there will be a force of attraction between the two because opposites attract. The strength of this attraction depends on how close the filament electron passes to the nucleus. The closer the filament electron passes to the nucleus, the stronger the attraction. The more energy the filament electron loses, the stronger the resulting Brems photon. Because of this, the Brems photon can vary from the maximum KVP selected, where the filament electron passes very close and loses all its energy, to near zero, where the filament electron passes at a distance and loses almost no energy. Shown in this figure here, you can see brems strahlong interaction, a Brems interaction event, and you can see how close the filament electron passes to the nucleus, determining the Brems photon energy. Passing very close to the nucleus causes a greater loss of energy that is released as a high energy Brems photon. The energy of a Brems photon can be found by subtracting the energy that the filament electron leaves the atom with from the energy it had upon entering. For example, a filament electron enters an atom with 100 kilo electron volts of energy. It passes very close to the nucleus and leaves with 30 kilo electron volts of energy. The Brems photon produced is 70 kilo electron volts. 100 kilo electron volts when it entered th minus 30 kilo electron volts when it left. And this is going to equal 70 kilo electron volts for the Brems photon. If that same filament electron passed at some distance from the nucleus and exited with 80 kilo electron volts of energy, the Brems photon would be 20 kilo electron volts. So we would have 100 kilo electron volts minus 80 kilo electron volts, and that will equal 20 kilo electron volts. The average energy of a Brems photon is one third of the KVP selected at the control panel.
In a tungsten target, most of the photons are brims for two reasons. First, with characteristic interactions, only those involving the K-shell are of sufficient energy to be useful. All others are too weak to contribute to the radiographic image and are typically filtered out of the beam by the 2.5 millimeters of total filtration that is built into the tube head assembly. Because tungsten has a K-shell binding energy of 69.5 keV, only those kilovoltage peak settings of 70 kVp or greater will produce K characteristic photons. All lower settings result in a beam made up of entirely of brims. Second, the filament electron is more likely to miss the orbital electrons of the target atom because they are in constant motion and the atom is mostly empty space. Certain properties characterize any given X-ray beam based on how it was produced and how it behaves in its interactions with matter. The interactions with matter are covered in detail in my video about Chapter 7, Interactions with Matter. The properties that the radiographer should be familiar with are beam quantity and beam quality and the defining terms of each. Before we get to that, a discussion of filtration is in order. In radiography, filtration refers to the use of a material, usually aluminum or an aluminum equivalent, to absorb X-ray photons from the X-ray beam. This filtration may be in the form of an inherent, an added, or a compensating filter. Inherent filtration is just that. It's inherent to the tube head assembly, the tube and the housing. The target window is the primary contributor to inherent filtration and equates to about 0.5 millimeters aluminum equivalent. In a general radiography tube head assembly, added filtration comes in the form of another 2.0 millimeters aluminum placed between the target window and the top of the collimator. The purpose of this added filtration is to remove the low energy X-ray photons from the beam before they can expose the patient and contribute to unnecessary radiation exposure. So in general purpose radiography tube head assemblies, a total of 2.5 millimeters aluminum equivalent filtration is in place to clean up the X-ray beam by removing the low energy photons that would not contribute anything useful to a diagnostic image. The combination of inherent and added filtration is referred to as total filtration. Compensating filters, as their name implies, are used to adjust or compensate for variations in patient thickness or density and create a more uniform exposure to the IR. Many compensating filter designs are a wedge shape, and that means that the thin portion of the wedge is placed over the thicker anatomic part, and the thick part of the wedge is placed over the thinner anatomic part, so thick over thin. These filters may be designed to attach to the bottom, bottom of the collimator or placed adjacent to or on the anatomic part of interest. So if you look at picture A, this is the one with the wedge filter. You can see that it is attached to the bottom of the collimator. And then in picture B, this is the boomerang filter and it's underneath the patient's shoulder. The use of compensating filters requires an increase in mass, and this is to maintain the overall exposure to the IR. And it's a trade-off between increasing the patient dose slightly to improve the image quality. As with all of radiography, we have the risk versus benefits. The benefits of exposing a patient to ionizing radiation must outweigh the harm caused by the exposure. The radiographer must always use sound judgment founded in science when incorporating compensating filters. 
Beam quantity refers to the total number of X-ray photons in a beam. Beam quantity is affected by mass, KVP, distance, and filtration. The radiographer should associate quantity with radiation dose. All other factors remaining constant, an increase in quantity increases the radiation dose that's delivered to the patient. Beam quantity is directly proportional to mass because mass controls the number of electrons boiled off of the filament and available to produce x-rays. It is considered the primary factor controlling quantity. Doubling the mass doubles the quantity, which is the output. When adjustments in quantity are desired, mass is the factor that you will adjust. Beam quantity varies as the square of the ratio of the change in KVP. If KVP is doubled, the intensity or quantity increases by a factor of four. However, because KVP controls both the number and energy of the x-rays in the beam, a small change in KVP exerts a large effect on exposure to the IR. This is why the 15% rule applies when changing the KV to affect exposure to the IR. A 15% increase in KVP is equivalent to doubling the mass. Beam quantity is strongly affected by changes in KVP because KVP gives kinetic energy to the filament electrons. That kinetic energy is converted to heat and X-ray photons, and the greater the kinetic energy, the greater the chances for X-ray production. It is less desirable to use KVP to change quantity because it influences too many other factors, penetrability and scatter production. This is related to image production and is less predictable in its imaging effect where quantity is concerned. Beam quantity varies inversely as the square of the distance. This is the inverse square law. And it states that the intensity of a beam is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the source. And you can see the inverse square law expressed as intensity one divided by intensity two equals distance two squared divided by distance one squared. The intensity or quantity quadruples if the distance is reduced to one half of its original value. X-ray photons diverge as they travel away from the source, and if the distance is shorter, they do not have the opportunity to diverge as much, and they are then concentrated on a smaller area. The extent to which the use of filtration decreases X-ray quantity depends on the thickness and the type of filtration material. Filtration absorbs low energy photons that do not contribute to the image and would otherwise add to the patient radiation dose. Added filtration placed at a collimator serves to reduce the patient dose by removing such photons. And you can see here in this table, it's showing the factors affecting beam quantity. So if we have an increase in mass, the effect on quantity increases. If we have an increase in KVP, the effect on quantity increases. And if we have an increase in distance, the effect on quantity decreases. Increase in filtration, the effect on quantity decreases. So this is showing you the effects by the inverse square law, what all of these um, technical factors have on the quantity of the beam. Beam quality refers to the penetrating power of the x-ray beam. Penetration refers to those x-ray photons that are transmitted through the body and reach the IR. It is desirable for some of the x-ray photons to penetrate the anatomic area of interest or we wouldn't have an image. Photons that reach the IR create the dark shades of the image. 
Areas where no photons reach result in the light or clear areas of the image, but both are needed to create the image and provide us with the contrast. Beam quality is affected by KVP and filtration and is controlled mainly by adjusting the KVP. As KVP increases, the beam's ability to penetrate matter also increases and vice versa. X-ray beams with high energy from high KVP settings are said to be high quality or hard beams. X-ray beams with low energy from low KVP settings are said to be low quality or soft beams. Beam quality is also affected by filtration. Filtration serves to remove the low energy photons, making the average energy quality higher. Think of this as the instructor dropping a student's two lowest test grades. Doing so will increase the student's average. And you can see here in this table, these are the factors affecting beam quality. So if we have an increase in KVP, that will increase our effect on quality. If we have an increase in filtration, that will increase our effect on quality. So these are directly proportional. Beam quality is measured by the half value layer or HVL. HVL is defined as the thickness of the absorbing material, which is the aluminum or aluminum equivalent filtration, necessary to reduce the energy of the beam to one half its original intensity. It is found by first measuring the intensity of the beam with a radiation detector, then placing aluminum filters of known thickness between the tube and the detector until the intensity reading is reduced to one half of the original value. Normal HVL of general diagnostic beams is three to five millimeters aluminum. Related to this discussion of quantity and quality, are the terms primary beam and remnant beam. Primary beam refers to the x-ray beam as it is upon exiting the collimator and exposing the patient. Remnant beam refers to the x-ray beam that remains after interaction with the patient and is exiting the patient to expose the IR. The remnant beam is composed of transmitted photons which are the ones exiting the patient without having interacted with anatomic structures, and then scattered photons, which are those that have lost energy and have been redirected after interacting with anatomic structures. The emission spectrum graphically illustrates the X-ray beam. The X-ray beam is the result of two different anode target interactions. The emission spectrum for each looks different because of the nature of each. So we have the brims and the characteristic. Characteristic photons have a discrete emission spectrum and brims photons have a continuous emission spectrum. We combine the essential parts of each to create the X-ray emission spectrum. These graphs are handy visuals of the nature of the beam and are useful for illustrating the effects of different influencing factors on them. The discrete emission spectrum illustrates characteristic X-ray production. The axis of the X is the X-ray energy and the axis with the Y is the number of each type of X-ray photon. It is called discrete because the photon energies are limited to just a few exact values. Characteristic photons are produced when outer shell electrons fill inner shell vacancies in the atoms and the energy is determined by the difference in the shells involved. So remember that characteristic photons are named for the shell being filled. There are a number of bars at each level. K, L, M, and et cetera, representing the energy variations depending on the shells involved. For example, there is a bar for K characteristic photons produced when L electrons fill K, a bar for when M electrons fill K, and so on. The bars are at different points along the 
x-axis according to their energy, but they're all k characteristic. The same is true for l characteristic in each of the others. The lowest energy bars, those representing the lowest energy interactions, may not be labeled because they are no, of no diagnostic value and will not create an image. The height of the bars relative to the y-axis indicates the number of photons of that type. The figure on the slide demonstrates a spectrum for a tungsten target. Other target materials are similar, but the energy range on the x-axis is different. With tungsten targets, K characteristic x-rays are of the greatest importance because they contribute to the radiographic image. Beginning on the right side of the graph, K characteristic photons have an energy range of approximately 57 kilo electron volts. If an L electron fills the K shell vacancy to 69 kilo electron volts if the O or P shell fills the K-shell vacancy. Then moving down the x-axis, the L characteristic x-ray energies are plotted. They have an energy range of approximately 9 kilo electron volts, and that is if an M-shell electron fills the L-shell vacancy, to 12 kilo electron volts if an O or P-shell electron fills the L-shell vacancy. Beyond L characteristic, there is really no point in plotting the energies because they are so low that they are filtered out of the beam and are of no diagnostic use. The continuous emission spectrum is going to illustrate the Brim's X-ray production. The X-axis represents the energy and the Y-axis the number of photons. Because Brems photons are the result of the filament electrons' attraction to the nucleus, their energy depends on the strength of that attraction. Their energy can range from just above zero to the maximum KVP selected on the control panel. Unlike the finite characteristic photon energies, Brems photons have a range of energy with most being one-third of the KVP selected. A graph of Brim's photons creates a bell-shaped continuum, and the left side of the curve is just above zero, and then the right side of the curve touches the x-axis at the KVP selected. The peak of the curve is approximately one-third of the KVP indicated. And this figure here shows a tungsten target spectrum other target materials are similar, but the energy range on the x-axis is different. To graphically represent the x-ray beam as a whole, we will combine both spectrums. As with the other two graphs, the x-axis represents the energy and the y-axis the quantity of each type of photon. The continuous portion is used as is because it represents most of the beam. The discrete line is reduced to the highest energy K characteristic bar. For a tungsten target, it is positioned at approximately 69 keV. The other discrete lines are omitted because they represent photons that are generally filtered out of the beam and they're of no consequence to imaging. The X-ray emission spectrum is used to graphically represent the energies of the X-ray beam. It can also be used to reflect the effects of different factors on the X-ray beam. The changes in the spectrum with respect to the Y-axis indicates the changes in quantity. Changes in the spectrum with respect to the X-axis indicate changes in quality. There are five factors that change the appearance of the X-ray emission spectrum, and it's MA, KVP, tube filtration, generator type, and then the target material. Changes in MA affect beam quantity. All other factors remain constant. An increase in MA increases the amplitude of both the continuous and discrete portions of the spectrum. Remember that when MA is increased on the control panel, 
more electrons are boiled off of the filament and are available for x-ray production. This increases the quantity of x-rays produced. Because the KVP setting controls energy, the spectrum does not move along the x-axis with changes in MA, nor does the discrete line move because it is related specifically to the target material. Shown in this figure here, it shows a change in milliamperage, and it shows the two emission spectrums, illustra illustrates the result of an increase in the MA for the purple curve. Increases in MA increase the quantity of radiation. KEV is the kilo electron volt, and MA is the milliampere. Changes in KVP affect beam quality and quantity. All other factors remaining constant, an increase in KVP increases the amplitude of both continuous and discrete portions of the spectrum. And this will shift the right side of the curve to the right along the x-axis. When KVP is increased at the control panel, there's a larger potential difference that occurs in the x-ray tube and this will give more electrons the kinetic energy to produce the x-rays and increasing the kinetic energy overall. The result is more photons, which is the quantity, which increases the amplitude of the spectrum and high energy photons, which is the quality. This will shift the right side of the curve farther to the right. The discrete line does not move because it is related specifically to the target material. And in this figure here, this is the change in KVP, and you can see the two emission spectra lines. They're illustrated um, showing the result of an increase in KVP at the purple curve. Increases in KVP increase the quantity and the quality of radiation. The addition of tube filtration or introducing a more efficient filtration material into the tube removes photons from the beam. All other factors remaining constant, an increase in tube filtration causes a decrease in quantity and an increase in quality. The removal of photons causes a decrease in quantity reflected by a decrease in the amplitude of both of the continuous and discrete portions of the curve. Because it removes more low energy photons than the high energy photons, there's a greater decrease on the left side of the continuous portion, and there's a shift in the peak of the curve to the right. Remember that with low energy photons removed, the average energy is higher. And again, the discrete line does not move because it is related specifically to the target material. Changes in generator type change the x-ray production efficiency of the machine. High frequency units are more efficient in producing x-rays than the single phase units. This means that with the same amount of electricity or power, a high frequency unit produces more x-rays. In the x-ray emission spectrum, this is represented by an increase in amplitude and average energy. If a generator operates more efficiently, more filament electrons have the energy to produce x-rays, increasing the quantity and showing on the graph as an amplitude of the curve. There are also a greater number of higher energy photons so increasing the average energy, and then it shifts the peak to the right. You can see in this chart here, <clears throat> this is showing a change in the generator type. So it shows the three emission spectra, and it illustrates the result of a change in the generator types. So note that as the efficiency of the generator type increases, so does x-ray quantity given the same amount of electricity used. The general radiographer does not have the ability to select the target material used, except in mammography. 
Although virtually all radiographic x-ray tubes employ tungsten targets, it is instructive to consider how altering the target material might affect the emission spectrum. As the atomic number, which is the Z number, of the target material goes up, so does the average energy, the quantity of photons, and the position of the discrete line on the spectrum. With increases in atomic number, each atom is more complex, representing a bigger target for a filament electron to interact with. This increases the likelihood of interaction and the number of photons produced. As quantity increases, the number of higher energy photons increase, as well as the average energy. In the figure shown here, the discrete lines represent the K characteristic photons. The energy of these photons depends on the K shell binding energy and which outer shell fills the vacancy. As the binding energy of the target material increases, the discrete line shifts to the right. And we want to note that the low atomic number targets, such as molybdenum and rhodium, are currently used in mammography because their lower K characteristic X-rays are better suited to the lower energies used in that modality. On the other hand, gold is never suitable as a target material because of its low melting point and high cost. Shown in this table here are the factors affecting the emission spectrum. So if we have an increase or an improvement in MA, that is going to increase the effect on quantity and it will have no effect on quality. If we increase the KVP, we will increase quantity and quality. If we increase our tube filtration, we will decrease quantity and increase quality. If we increase our generator type or have an improvement in our generator type, it will increase quantity and quality. And if we have an increase in our target material or an improvement in our target material, we will increase quantity and quality.